Well, hello there. It's Dr. Boz, and I am live here on Tuesday nights, and you can see that I am in the wild. I'm not in the office. We are in a series uh, that is that we are calling Keto in the Wild and reviewing how to do keto during those times when there's not a lot of options for um, for staying keto because of all of the temptations that are around. I think of two seasons in the year that are really difficult to stay keto, and that is the season of the holidays, which is not now, but then the season uh, of how uh, to stay keto while you're doing summer. And these six weeks of summer have been fun for me, uh, fun for uh, my husband to watch me uh, struggle through some of staying keto while all the temptations show up. Um, and I am sharing some of that with you. So before we get started on that, I love to see your comments coming through that you can hear me. <laughs> so give me a, a, a fact that you can hear me while I check my numbers. I have been doing what I do every week, which is um, I have uh, been fasting since Sunday. And this week I did a pretty good job by um, stating that the uh, not only just staying keto, but also um, getting in the sauna twice. Thank you for the sound uh, affirmations there. I really appreciate that. Um, and I also uh, did a workout on Monday and on Tuesday. Uh, the that is a a cycle that I I I didn't used to do so well, but I'm doing better at now. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I actually can feel that. My ketones today are 3.8, and my sugar is counting down to, yeah, 73. So if somebody wants to do the math for me on that, that would be helpful. Uh, but as you can see, I am out here ketoing in the wild. And tonight I am uh, showing you how I get through the summer by having a few activities that are less than scheduled. Uh, what I mean by that is I'm not in the office. The didactics that um, the picture isn't clear. I wonder why that is. Um, uh, the, so hopefully everybody else sees a clear picture and it's not fogged up because it is very humid here and my lens could be very smudged, but I, hopefully that's not the case. No, I, I've, uh, I've got a, a season where I have had um, the pleasure of learning so much from my patients, especially those that break a cycle. They are the ones where I was sharing with my support group this morning that I was privileged to see patients in Salt Lake City, Utah for the first 10 years uh, of my career. And one little old ladies that came to see me was in her 90s and she was skiing and I'm like man you are an outlier how do you do that and when you get to know this woman she had lots of family patterns that she did not uh she was not supposed to be that healthy she should not be skiing in her 90s ski I mean I, the first thing that I thought of is oh my gosh she has her birth date wrong She'll be 90. <laughs> so I'm going to tell some stories about how do you find and copy the patterns of the people who break the cycle. So before we do that, I am uh, actually am prepared with water this week. Last week, I didn't have that. I did put pucker up in there. And I have an announcement that this week, um, first of all, we have a uh, we have a newsletter that has been coming out a lot more regularly, praise God, <laughs> than it was for about 18 months. Uh, I have had a our Friday newsletter come out regularly now for several weeks. And um, I want those of you that have just joined the team, if you sign up for that on our 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 website, uh, bozmd.com, the newsletter is going to prepare you for the next few weeks because the folks that are out there watching, you guys are now uh, in a in a couple of different camps and we're trying to communicate to you uh, effectively. Some of you are new to keto and some of you are not so new to keto. You're seasoned. And in the month of August, there are, there are two messages coming out. One is for newbies. And if you have anybody that is um, 
uh, anybody that's new to keto and you're, you want help lifting them over the threshold, teaching them how to do keto, well, then I would tell you, be sure to read the newsletter. <laughs> the newsletter is going to give you some hints on how to help them because we have a lot of a lot of you folks writing in asking, how do I teach my friend? How do I explain this? And some of the things we've done lots and lots of times again and again, but it's been a while. So we're trying to give that message very clearly. The newsletter is going to keep you up to date. So uh, please read it over the next month because it's going to save a lot of confusion for folks that are new versus folks that are not uh, that are seasoned. So I am drinking Pucker Up today and- Thank you for the praise of that newsletter, but the announcement that I wanted to make that I've tried to make three times now is that if you are going to be in Orlando, stop by the Orlando Summit uh, and meet what I think is the best social experiment in the keto world. If you're looking for a, a community that really focuses on that connection, those social relationships, the gals that run the Keto Summit in Orlando, they top the list. And the interns this year, the ones that have been here for the summer are really, uh, they've been working hard getting everything set up for the booth that we're gonna have. And if you remember being in college, <laughs> they're all in college and have said, hey, um, uh, what if, so they're getting paid like interns are going to be, uh, uh, giving samples of what I drink on the show, which is some bubble water and pucker up. They're also uh, going to be selling <laughs> a, a drink that they have come up with that they think is the best way to drink ketones. And I said, whatever money you make, you can keep for college. So if nothing else, uh, they are, they're going to be doing an experiment where testing your blood sugar, testing your ketones, having the sample that they are sampling uh, which is the free stuff, the ketones and, and some water, but the one that's really good, and I'll save it for their punchline, and they're going to be able to charge some money for. And I said, whatever money you make, you can keep for college. So swing by and donate to their college fund. It's not for me. I really have enjoyed them. And if you've ever worked around the next generation, it's, it's just been inspiring. Like, oh, I remember. I remember being that naive. <laughs> I remember being that hopeful. And I appreciate how much energy they've, they've helped me. So anyway, that's, uh, if you're going to be around for the Keto Summit, there's two other things that I have uh, to tell you before we get to the message. And that is um, my friend, Mindy Peltz, is, uh, is doing her uh, big debut from what her book, Fast Like a Girl, is teaching. So if you go to the, the, the Dr. Bob page, I'm going to show you on my iPad here. And you look at, um, so you go to the Dr. Boz page, and then you go to the Dr. Boz favorites. Um, this is my favorite page on the Dr. Boz page. First of all, whoever signed up on the sign up sheet for my son, I cannot tell you how thankful I was to get your, uh, his one sign up. The one warm lead this week where he got to call them and they had honest questions. Uh, I, as you saw a few weeks ago when I was teaching about how much data matters, he, uh, he has knocked on over 3,000 doors this summer as a door-to-door -door salesman selling home security systems. He is a, a rising senior, junior, senior, depending on how you, how you uh, count it. And he has, he's been accepted to law school, but his parents told him that having a, having a skill set in actual sales will help you no matter what you do but it's hard it's hard so anyway whoever signed up to for the one warm lead this week i just thank god for you <laughs> thanks for helping him anyway the other two things on there the keto summit is there if you want any questions and the third one is fast like a girl uh and this is my friend mindy peltz who has a team that is um she's really put together we have one lecture i think i'm on the first day and oh, we had the best discussion about what, what I advise patients. And if you've ever seen that discussion between two clinicians, two people who've been advising patients, the way she asks questions and the way I'm able to get deeper into that discussion, it's, well, it, it was even fun to, for me to re-listen to it, which I don't like to do usually. So that's one of her things and we're helping her. Um, if you sign up, the, the, the conference is free. 
But if, if you do the free version, you have 24 hours to watch the videos and then you don't get to go back and watch them again. But if you sign up before the conference, I think it's only like 65 or $70 and uh, you get all the lectures as many times as you want. And if you sign up after the conference, it's like $350, so it's much more expensive. And again, I really try to support the people who are out there doing keto in a way that is you know, really helpful. So I, uh, I want, if, if you're looking for some great content, really well organized, and once again, the leader is you know, just one of my favorites. Uh, click on the Dr. Mindy Peltz link, um, when you use our link to go to her, she gets to see that we're supporting her. Um, I'm not as much as interested in any, in any of the commissions. I want people to know that, I want her to know we support her. And instead of sending out a blast email, uh, which we um, are trying to save those emails because we have a lot of communication coming out in the next week, I'm trying to send you to the Dr. Boss Favorites page, click on there. You can see the list of speakers and when they're speaking and say hi to Mindy for me. All right, so we've got the uh, Keto Summit taken care of. We've got uh, Fast Like a Girl. And then remember October 6th, I've never been to Louisville, but Keto Palooza, uh, I'm coming your way. So we'll talk more about that as time goes on. Tonight, I wanted to get back to this, um, this privilege that I've had as being a physician for um, 20, yeah, since 1998. So what, 25 years now? And when I look at, the things the patients have taught me, uh, the times when I step back and say, how do I get more patients like that? And I don't mean that I did something to them. I mean that they were able to break a cycle, uh, that we all have these inherited thoughts, inherited behaviors, inherited genetics. And we think, okay, that means I'm destined for diabetes. I'm destined to be an alcoholic. I'm destined to be a night owl. And that's not true. Uh, all of those are associated with things that you learn, learned behavior. And in this season, Keto in the Wild, where I'm trying not to do this from the office, I'm trying to relax, which if you tuned in last week, you know that I'm not great at that. And this is, I have to work at that. It, it's, I know it sounds like this placated answer, like in an interview, tell us what your weaknesses are. And you say, oh, gee, I worked too hard. Uh, but I really do have um, a character flaw. Of, I schedule my timeouts and I have to schedule them and they still, they still get in the way of things. But when I look at the, those people who broke the cycle, um, who, who knew that they, were, they wanted a different path, who ended up 96 years old, and skiing, there are uh, times where I've written down, what do they do differently? And I, I try whenever I, to, whenever I do this exercise again, I don't look back at what my previous notes were, but I love comparing them because I've done it about three times in my career now where I'm like, okay, what do the people that succeed do that the other people don't? And um, we're on, we have, I, I came up with six really solid rules uh, this time. And I've had a list of 10 before, and I've had a list of uh, about eight before, because two of them were kind of the same when I look back. And um, so four weeks ago, I said, okay, number one, uh, they are, they, when they get tired, they rest, but they don't give up. Meaning they don't just throw everything into the ditch and not try. They, they rest, but they don't give up. The second week is when I talked about my son Walker and using data. Because the second thing is, is the people who, who break the cycle, I call them cycle breakers, and I am a cycle breaker is something I'm trying to help you say that out loud, that they, data is their friend. They're, even when they're in a slump, they still measure because it is such a truth teller that it's not all forms of data, but it's enough data where they are, um, they're, they're truly engaged uh, in tracking themselves and they can cope with the disappointment when the data isn't great. And it's, it's amazing how short their slump is relatively to the other people. And that's what we talked about when, when I was talking about my son. So last week, um, we talked about, they know their triggers. 
And I talked about a couple of my triggers. I talked about some triggers that my support group had shared that week. And tonight's uh, thumbnail gives it a way of how to be the happy loser. <laughs> and I, I think it is a really good uh, thumbnail when we get to the end. So let's see if I can connect the dots for you. So number the number three rule um, is, or the number four rule is um, that they never arrive, that the work is never done. And that can sound exhausting, like who wants to do that? But I really find that they have a different vision in their mind. So when, I, when I'm asking people, when they come into the clinic and I say, well, what's, what's the reason you're coming in to see me? What's your, that usually leads to what's your goals? And sometimes we don't get to that on the first visit, but we get to it on the second or third visit. And you start to sort that some people have just short-term goals. And the ones that are cycle breakers, they also have long-term goals. And the long-term goals are really, um, well, they are what the short-term goals are steps to. So let me explain. So some short-term goals that I might have or the people that come to see me or the folks in my support group, short-term goals are getting to a certain weight. Um, there's other ones like hitting a certain number of ketones. You know, like, okay, okay. Uh, is that doing anything? Um, other short-term goals have been <laughs> to go to a movie and not eat popcorn. I love that goal. I'm like, that could be a hard one, <laughs> but let's see if we can help you. Um, so short-term goals are just that, they are short-term. And uh, when I look at the people who are cycle breakers, their long-term goals really are the baby habits, the baby goals that are gonna lead to the long-term, that are, that are short-term that will lead to the long-term ones. So let me, let me be more specific. So when I look at some of my long-term goals and um, you know, I shared with my support group that over the, since COVID hit, I feel like I've been in crisis management, like short-term goal. If I can just get to this, I'll, everything will be okay. Okay, if I can just get past that, everything will, okay, if I can just get past that, everything will be okay. And, you know, my support group here on Tuesday mornings gets to hear about some of the setbacks I've had. And it, it really is, I, I finally feel like, okay, I, I should be able to not be in crisis for the next six months. Uh, and let's see how well that works for me. Um, because it's in that season where the crisis seems to always be what's motivating me or somebody that's using a short-term goal that I can't even think of a long-term goal. Like I just need to get through next week. So I've used these long-term goals that patients have told me as a way to set up my own. The first one is, um, well, I want to do CrossFit into my 80s. So let me tell you where that comes from. Um, as many of you know, I have three sons and our youngest son, when we moved to Florida, was a sophomore in high school. And he's on the wrestling team and he's on the pole vault team. And, you know, when he's exercising and in really good shape, um, I, I find my role as a mom of being part of that, like beacon for him, easy to say, okay, what can I do to help him? But we were living an hour to hour 20, hour and 20 minutes away from his school. So we were spending two and a half hours to three hours on the road every day getting to and from work with me and school for him. So I set a goal that I would go to CrossFit once a week. And I would keep this calendar that would just put a hashtag on the week if I did it. And there were some weeks that it was a donut hole, uh, meaning I was a big fat zero. I got nothing. I did not do any workouts. Uh, but that short term goal was to get at least uh, eight weeks consecutively that was one time a week. And that was my short-term goal. And so I look around at these long-term goals and um, I see that the people who are able to say that the work is never done. Once the, one, once the once a week was my goal, I then added the next goal, which is, okay, let's see if I can get eight weeks in a row where I work out twice a week. And I think that took me nine months to get that goal done because it was, yeah, it was terrible. I was terrible at it. Um, that the other, um, uh, the other long, so the long-term goal of me doing CrossFit into my 80s 
uh, CrossFit seems to be the, the place where I go to get, I, I really like it. There's, a, there's not only a community that's there, but I can take my sons and they really like it. They do, they hit the leaderboard. I hit the survival board. <laughs> Uh, like to, to today, one of the workouts was to throw the wall ball up into the air after doing a whole bunch of rowing. And there's this suggestion board that says you should throw a 26 pound wall ball. I'm like, no way. I'm like, maybe a 10 pound wall ball. And then I said, no, even that's too heavy. Let's do a six pound wall. I was the worst wall ball in the room. I was the loser in the room. But I was so happy that I did it. And I think that's where I find my short-term goals have to be present, that I have to be feeding into something that really motivates me. I, I, I really draw energy from having a community. I mean, I don't have a, a support group, a free support group every Tuesday morning at the bowling alley across the parking lot from my office because I have nothing better to do. I have lots of other things to do, but I really want to know the people of Tampa. I really want to know the people in my area and I get as much out of that support group as they do. I have a community where I get to be accountable to. And I find when I do that um, in my exercise, I can be the loser in the room, but I still win because I'm showing up. I'm still trying. And I, I really think that's what CrossFit has to offer, which is a, a community that says, you think you can't do uh, 15 wall balls after rowing 85 calories or whatever it was. But everybody else in the room did it, and I, I can just show up and try. So uh, the CrossFit, doing CrossFit into my 80s comes from that 96-year-old that was skiing. She didn't wake up at 96 and decide she was going to do that. She wanted to be that level of an active person for decades, and she just kept doing the little things that if you were trying to measure a short-term goal, you would have been the loser. But I'm a happy loser because I really am using this short-term goal because I have a longer one. And the two other things that are on my list is I want to hike Mount Kilimanjaro, mainly because it's on my husband's bucket list. He wants to hike this. We've had, he's said this for, oh, this is embarrassing. He's probably said this for 15 years. And we've never been to the continent where Mount Kilimanjaro is, let alone hike Mount Kilimanjaro. So I'm already 51. I'll be 52 in a few months. I'm probably not going to hike Mount Kilimanjaro till I'm I don't know, closer to 55, maybe 60. So if I want to get to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, I cannot start preparing for it six months before that hike. I have to have something in my life that keeps me in good enough shape that I still might not get to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, but I'm going to try and I'm going to have a, an almost chance when I do it. So that short-term goal of so I'm up at CrossFit uh, once, you know, now I'm, now I'm at twice a week. Don't push me. Three times a week is not, not predictable. Twice a week is all I do. Um, but it's the long-term goal that gets me the happy loser. The third one is I didn't have kids till I was almost 30, which means now that I'm 50, my kids are in that 17 to 22 range and they have not reproduced yet. And I don't want them to, they're not ready to. I mean, if they did, I would be happier, but let's just hope for their sake that's not in the cards anytime soon. So it puts me in my 60s at the first chance that my kids are going to have grandchildren. And I don't want to be the old grandma. I want to be the grandma who can do what my mother did with my kids. So today I asked this of my support group, and I had a few people that... Um, that I said, okay, I, I'd like to do check-ins, which is what we do at a support group. Um, before they can ask me a question, they have to introduce themselves. I ask the veterans to go first, meaning if they've been a few times, tell me that. And um, then I say, I have a check-in, something they can answer. Uh, and I ask, what is a short-term goal? And how does that um, short-term goal lead to your long-term goal? And one of the guys who's been coming a while is a really good, um, you know, me member of the community says, you know, I have these grandkids and right now they're, I think two, four, six, and eight, and they're all boys. And he's a man. He said, all of their grandparents are alive, but I'm the only one who's has enough health to be in, in a playfulness phase with them. 
And he goes, had I looked at my health two years ago before I lost this weight, before I really understood how to get myself healthier, I, I would be in the same health problems as them. And, you know, his long-term goal had a lot to do with his grandkids. And so I look at that answer uh, and, and that is a, a long-term goal uh, for somebody who broke the cycle, but that guy's in his 60s. So then I pose this question to some of the folks that are in their younger years. And somebody on my team today said, yeah, I'm in my 30s and I was raised by my grandparents. And over this last season of life, I've had to walk them through hospice. And if you've ever taken your first journey through hospice, watch somebody die. They said, I didn't think that these you know, problems were my issue. They, she was overweight and she had some problems and she ate just like everybody else did. But her long-term goal is to not do that, is to not suffer like what her grandparents did. And, you know, I think back to that, you know, the first time you see somebody really struggling with their health. And as a physician, it's, it's like Groundhog's Day. You see it again and again and again. And they really do have, I mean, it's a, it's a suffering that's, that's so deep and disruptive that, you know, one of the guys in the support group this morning said, yeah, the average time after retirement is six years of functional life. And he's probably four months into his keto journey, kind of new to the team, but he goes, I can't believe how much better I am, even just with losing. I think he, I mean, he's lost some significant weight. I think like 50 or 60 pounds, but he's, he said, how did I, how did I miss the first you know, 12 years or 15 years of my retirement without having that vitality back? So you look at their long-term goals and for the 30 year old, it's all right, that hospice stuff sucked. That chronic disease stuff was awful to watch. I don't want that as the long-term goal. But if the short-term goals aren't like habit stacking her way to that, it becomes just too mythical. Like, oh, great. I want to do, I want to play with my grandkids that aren't even born yet, that I don't even know if I'm going to be privileged enough to live long enough to get them or if my kids will have them. So it becomes this, it's, you can't touch it. The short-term goals in the people who broke the cycle, the short-term goal changed uh, to keep supporting their long-term goal. So uh, the first one that I thought was a very good was watching their grandparents die, not wanting to be in hospice and how her short-term goals are now little steps to keep supporting the long-term goal. The, uh, the second thing that you heard again and again was, um, especially from my teammates where they said, you know, I didn't realize how much of this disease starts in your 30s that when i have some like a ct angio of one of my patients come back and there's already calcification in their coronary arteries and they're 32 and they're not that overweight but they have that disease process they have that dr bob's ratio that's too high which means their insulin is overworking it starts in their teenage years it took at least 10 years of pathology to get that calcification in that patient and as my team sees that, it kind of blows their mind. Like, wait a minute, I've never had a CT angio. Do I have that? And that's where, it, you know, it really starts to, to be applicable to, you know, the people in the front row of my team say, oh my gosh, this disease stuff really started so long ago that, and you can't feel it, you can't see it. So to have... You know, one of the goals in, a, in the check-in was to have a Dr. Boss ratio that was under 40 for six weeks. And that's really hard to do because you have to, I mean, the Dr. Boss ratio really reflects how well is insulin working in your cells today. And healthy bodies keep getting better. So it keeps getting a little harder. But what was powerful is how well those uh, short-term goals will lead to if they do have calcium in their coronary arteries, how do you prevent it from blocking that coronary artery or that cerebral artery or the carotid artery? You know, how do you stop it from the disease pathology? And those short-term goals lead to the long-term goals in the people that are cycle breakers. 
So I thought I would ask for a little bit of this because I do use your comments to help see, am I hitting what this audience is interested in? So especially if you're turning up on the live, which there are no commercials and I do watch these, uh, these uh, comments, my team will post the comments that are um, relevant to what we're talking about and I will answer those questions at the end. But I, think about this before you post it. So what is a long-term goal that you have? And it would be great if you tell me your age, because I do think the different generations have different long-term goals. And then what's the short-term goal that is delivering the steps that are habit stacking to get you to the long-term goal? Let me just remind you what mine was. Mine is, I want to be the cool old lady. <laughs> I want to be the grandma that has the energy and the, and the flexibility and the health to be present in the lives of my grandkids, to be around when my sons have kids and they have kids that screw it up and they have kids that do it wrong, but they have a grandma that can be present like my mom was for my kids. But that is too mythical. It can't, it's not tangible. So some of the other goals were, well, I know if I'm still doing CrossFit in my eighties, I'm probably the loser in the room, but I am the happy loser because I kept going. I started out with, I need eight consecutive weeks of going one time a week. And do not add to that, meaning Annette, do not add to that until you get eight consecutive weeks. And then set the goal for something two times a week. And actually what I did, because I kept failing on the second times a week, I said, okay, I'm gonna have one time to the gym and one time to the sauna. And when I got that for eight weeks in a row, then I finally added the second workout at CrossFit. And I'm the loser. I am the worst one in the room, but that's how, where the thumbnail came from is I'm a happy loser because it's really leading me. So I would love to see what your long-term goals are and what are uh, some of the short-term goals that are feeding into that. And I'll use that for the last, I have the last two written out uh, because I really think it is, these are the six rules that I know when people break cycles, when they're cycle breakers, they do this. Um, and we'll talk more about those in the upcoming weeks. So um, I, I also, um, oh, I haven't been drinking my bubble water. So if I check my numbers again, it's probably not gonna be any different. Mm. But it is sure good. All right, so I'm gonna look at your, um, your comments. And I think, I think they're posted. So let's see if I can have my team pin the one at the top. Um, or for, usually I can see the one that's pinned and I can't see it today. So, hmm. So I, I'm reading a few of your. Um, the sound just blasted. Oopsie daisy. It probably was from my water. I probably touched it. Um, I'm trying to get to the, the most recent uh, comment. And then I, so let me just read a couple of them. Debbie actually is a really big uh, community member here. Debbie, uh, I think it's pronounced hobble. She says age 62. And I want to chase my grandkids if, and once they arrive. Yes. Um, uh, to be the cool <laughs> and action Grammy. Fun, fun, fun. Stay strong and functional workouts, right? Uh, with the high intensity uh, intermittent training workouts, infrared sauna four times a week. So um, yeah, he just said the sound just got 100% better. I don't know what I did to make it better. Dang it. <laughs> so uh, who knows? Um, let's see. Yeah, now the audio is working. Who knows what I did to do that? So here's a couple of other ones. Um, so my team, I can't get them. I, I can't see the the pinned ones, whichever ones you've pinned. Usually they pin the ones at the top. Um, I don't know how to find it. Find it tonight. Um, so hang with me. I'll, I'll do two more of these. I'll just do a couple of check-ins. So we have somebody named Oh M Peacock says forty three. I'm currently caring for a parent in hospice. It, it, it's truly like, this is such a rite of passage. 
I have another colleague who's just buried one of his parents. And I told him, you know, you don't think about it, but when you become the orphan, <laughs> when your parents are gone, it, it changes how you look at things. And when you're in your 40s is usually the first time you witness hospice. So here she is. I'm currently caring for a parent in hospice. My long-term goal is not age like my mother. My short-term goal, question mark, maybe fast for 36 hours once a week for eight weeks and then 48 hours uh, for eight weeks, then 72 hours for eight weeks. That is a really good goal. Yeah, when, when I look at uh, the short-term goals versus the long-term goals, uh, we talked about this on our team meeting today too, which is there's a difference between lifespan and health span. And the health span has to do with how healthy are you as you age and how, how well are you able to deliver that um, you know, that life in those elder years. Like the guy who said, yeah, the average time after uh, retirement is six years of functional health. And then you start declining so much, you don't get to enjoy it. And I need more than six years of that. <laughs> I need a lot more than six years of that. Well, uh, I, I will sign off um, uh, tonight with, I, I'm sorry, I can't coordinate to see which uh, comments are there. And they're coming in fast enough that I, I I can't, I can only read them for about 45 seconds on the screen. So I will sign off and we'll do a better job of answering your questions next week. Uh, you'll tune in for two more weeks and please sign up for those uh, emails because you newbies and the folks that are seasoned, we are trying to communicate you to you in different ways. And we hope, hope those messages come across in our weekly newsletter. We will see you next week, everybody. And if you're in Orlando, I answer questions on Saturday morning and please uh, give support to those interns. They have been They've been a life of a line of life for me this summer. Signing off, everybody.